Hello everyone and welcome to another video on building serverless Java applications on AWS. In this video, we're going to take a look at building single purpose handlers with the AWS SAM CLI. Now, in some of the other videos I've covered around Java, we've been looking at Spring and running Spring Boot APIs on Lambda. And that's great if you are running an API, but what about if you need a single piece of functionality to run next to your API? The typical example I always think about is sending emails. If you want to send an email from your application, you maybe don't want to build that directly into your API. You don't want your API to be talking to your mail server. Because if you get a sudden burst of requests into your API, how does your mail server deal with that? And that's where services like AWS Lambda and single purpose handlers can become really powerful. For example, your API could simply talk to a queue and then you could have a single Lambda function that's only responsibility is sending emails, reading things from that queue. So to do that and have a look at single purpose handlers, we're going to be using the AWS serverless application model. So as a prerequisite, if you're following along, you'll need to have the AWS SAM CLI installed. I'll put some links in the description for you to do that. So if I come over to a terminal window now, and I'm just going to check I've got the SAM CLI installed, which I believe I do. And then I'm just going to run a SAM init command. And what SAM init will do will take me through a wizard that will allow me to set up a brand new serverless project. I'm going to use one of the pre-built templates. I'm just going to use the hello world example for now. No, of course we don't want to use Python. And then I'm going to look and use Java 11. So you see we've got number nine there. Um, you see there's a whole range of other options available here. You've got GraalVM, you've got Java 8. So there's a range of different pre-built templates. But we're going to use number nine for Java 11. We want to package our Lambda function as a zip file. I'm going to use Maven. And then I will give my app a name. Let's call it serverless Java. And this, what this is going to do now is it's going to take a copy from a template on GitHub. And it's going to give me a local project using the details that I configured. Okay, that has created now. Seemingly, I need to update my local SAM version. But what I'll get now, if I just have a look at my file system, is I will get a folder called serverless Java. And then within there, I get um, the actual templates and the application code. So if we just have a look through the file system, you see in my hello world folder, I've got my pomxml file. And as we dive down this um, file system, eventually we'll get to our actual application code, which is this app.java file. I'm just going to open this up in IntelliJ now and we'll have a quick look at the application code. Okay, so here we are in IntelliJ now and let's have a look at what a single purpose Lambda function looks like. Let's just minimize that over there. So typically a Lambda function is simply a class with a single public method that is your handler for the request that comes in. So you see we've got a class here named app and that app class implements a request handler for an API gateway request and an API gateway response. So this allows um, the Java runtime to perform serialization and deserialization on our behalf so that we can work with Java objects and it's kind of abstracted away from us, taking that event payload that comes into Lambda and converting that into an actual object. And then all we've got is this handle request method. And this is where we're actually going to do the work for our Lambda function. This method is what gets invoked on every single request that comes into Lambda. So you see, we've got two parameters here. We've got an API gateway event. This is our actual event payload. And then we've got this context object. But what this context object gives us is some contextual information about this specific invoke. So we can get the request ID, for example. We can get the name of the function. We can get the ARN. We can get the assigned memory. There's a whole bunch of different things we can get out of that context object. But the main thing we're going to be focused on is this input. And there are strongly typed objects available for a wide range of different event payloads that come into Lambda. API Gateway, SQS, Event Bridge. There's these pre-built Lambda objects, um, Java objects that you can use to 
um, source your Lambda function. And you see in here, much of this that's inside our function here is just um, pretty standard Java code. And then all we're doing is returning a response and we're actually just building the response that API Gateway is expecting. And we can do that using the builder on this response event object. So we're given a 200 status code and then we're just sending some hello world um, data back. One thing I'll just point out while we're talking about single purpose Lambda functions is that, as I said, this, this um, method here will be invoked on every single request. For example, if I was to add a constructor to my app class now, oh, anything I put within this constructor will only run once per execution environment. So this is where we can do any initialization. If we need to set up any SDKs, we've got any connections that can be reused from invoke to invoke, we can set all that up within our app. So let's just say, for example, my headers are always gonna be the same. So I could actually set up, if I was to create a, um, a hash map, a private hash map of type string string here and call that headers. And then I could actually initialize headers from within my um, from within my constructor. Better put the brackets in there. So now this headers hash map is going to get created once on my initial invoke, and then that can be reused every single time. So we're not initializing that hash map on every single request. We can just reuse it. Now that we've got this single purpose handler, let's have a look at the AWS SAM CLI. So if I go back to my command line now, you see in the root of this file system in the folder above where the pom.xml is, you see we've got this file called template.yaml. And if I just open this up in Visual Studio Code now, grab that from my other screen, we can have a look at this template.yaml file. And for anyone who's using CloudFormation or um, currently, then this will be quite familiar to you. So there's two parts to AWS SAM. The first is a set of extensions, if you will, on top of CloudFormation. So you see when we're defining our Lambda function here, the type is an AWS serverless function. This is specific to AWS SAM. If you try to deploy this in CloudFormation, CloudFormation will go, ah, no, I don't like that. So this is very specific to um, SAM. And it just simplifies a lot of things. So you see here, we're just specifying the um, where our code is. It's in that hello world function folder. We're specifying our handler, the runtime's Java. Um, so what will actually happen when I build this, and I'll do this in just a second, it will actually, Sam will actually compile the jar file for our Java application and just handle all of that for us. Sam does that on our behalf. The other thing that's really cool with AWS Sam is this events section. So we can define the events that are going to source our Lambda function. In this case, we're sourcing this Lambda function with API Gateway and the path is going to be hello, the method is going to be a get method. Now what Sam will actually do is it will create the API gateway on our behalf because we have at least one Lambda function that has an API source. If I was to have four Lambda functions in here all sourced by API gateway with different routes, Sam would still only create me one API gateway and it would map all them routes for me. So it takes away that complexity of API gateway, API gateway integrations and all of that fun stuff. So what I can do now if I quickly go back to my terminal and I can just run a SAM build. Remember, I'm running this from the same folder as my template.yaml file. And this is now going to actually, in essence, do a for each loop. And it's going to loop over each defined AWS serverless function in my application. And it's going to build my jar file. And you can actually see here, I've run the SAM build command, but it's actually using Maven and it's actually compiling my application. And that has now completed now we've got a compiled function. And if I just go back to my file system now, you see I've got this .aws sam folder that's been created. And this is where we can actually go and see the jar file and the mapped template for our application. If I come back to my terminal window now, I can just run a sam deploy and pass in the guided flag. And the guided flag will take me through another wizard to kind of configure how this is going to be deployed. So we're gonna call the CloudFormation stack serverless Java. Let's deploy that to EU West 1. 
And then there's a few different options here. So Sam is asking me if I want to confirm the changes before I deploy them. If I'm okay with IAM roles being created, do I want to enable or disable rollback? And this is a really interesting feature of AWS Sam is that Sam is asking me that, is it okay that you've not got authorization confirmed, um, enabled on your API? Yes, of course it is. This is Hello World. We don't need authorization for Hello World. And do we want to save them to a local file? And then we just leave the defaults at the end there. So these, these parameters I've set will get stored in a local file. You see, I've now got this samconfig.toml file, and that will actually store all of the parameters that I've set. I'm just going to pause the video for a second while Sam goes off and deploys this, and then we'll come back in just a moment. Okay, so that has created now, and you see in my actual template file, I defined some output parameters, and Sam has handily printed them out to my terminal. If I just scroll back up here, while Sam is deploying resources, you get real-time updates in your terminal about where Sam is up to, so we can see all that there. If I now take that API endpoint and open that up in a browser, there we are, hello world. We have just deployed a single purpose Java Lambda function. Now there's one other feature I just wanted to talk about with AWS SAM before we close down the video for this week, and that is SAM Accelerate. And what SAM Accelerate allows you to do is set up a real-time sync so that when you make a change to your Lambda function locally, SAM will automatically recompile and redeploy that. And it will redeploy that using the direct Lambda API calls as opposed to going through CloudFormation. So it's much faster. So how I do that is I can run the SAM sync command and I can pass in this watch flag. And if I pass that in, SAM will just give me another short wizard just to, oh, need a stack name. So we give a stack name of serverless Java. And what um, Sam is going to do now is going to set up this real-time sync. Now, the, what Sam is asking me here is that doing this with direct API calls to Lambda might cause some drift in my CloudFormation stack. So I would not advise doing this in your production stacks, even your shared beta environments, staging environments. This is purely for your development environment. But I'm quite happy with a bit of drift. Um, Ah, yep, need to pass in my region as well, of course. So I just pass in EU West 1. And then it's going to ask me if I'm okay with the drift again, because it will ask me that every single time. And there we are. So the first thing it's going to do is, even though I've just run a SAM deploy, it's actually going to recompile my Java application again. And it's just going to resync that um, to ensure that everything is synced up. Okay. So you see that um, Sam has just done a quick redeployment and it's deployed a couple of additional um, additional CloudFormation stack to just to handle and help with this automatic sync. And you see now my terminal is waiting for something to happen. See, I've just got this happening. So if I come back to my Java application now and let's change that from Hello World to Hello YouTube. And I hit save in there now and I flip back to my lamp, my terminal and you see that has just automatically started rebuilding my application on my behalf. Um, it's actually failed to build for some strange reason. Let's have a look. Ah, my tests have failed, of course. Um, so if I come back into my Java project, into my tests and I look at my test, it's expecting hello world in my test. So I update my test as well. That's going to recompile my application and then we will get that automatic redeployment. That's finished. That took about three or four seconds to sync. If we come back and we flick that back to hello world, update my test this time and update my actual application code, save both of them files and come back to my terminal and that is going to resync again. So this is really helpful to get into a really good development cadence because you can have your terminal window running, automatically syncing any changes and you can just be aware and developing and just periodically rerunning your integration tests, for example. Now I wanna close out on testing there because in next week's video, we're going to deep dive into how to unit test your Lambda applications. It's really interesting when you get into testing with serverless because serverless is lots of these loosely small, loosely coupled, loosely joined services. You really want to be testing in the cloud as quickly as possible. 
And that makes unit testing and running tests locally really important because you want to unit test your, your applications on your local machine and then put them into the cloud as quickly as possible to integration test. But that is for next week. That's just a little sneak peek for you. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you liked it, then please like, please subscribe, please share. If you're interested in any more Java-based content, then feel free to reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever social media platform takes your fancy. I will see you next time, Java folks.